There is no more controversial problem about the domestic affairs of this country at the present time than drugs. The word drugs has a very funny semantic problem. You have a place called a drugstore. which is perfectly inoffensive and a regular part of the scene of life in these United States. But at the same time, you have a word drug, as when we say a person is drugged, which means that he is happy, but incompetent. under the influence of heavy medical sedation. We also have another word that should be drugged, I suppose, if we use it in that way, which is called drunk. Because the person, uh, even presently inebriated with alcohol, is just as much drugged as a person might be under the influence of morphine is rendered insensitive and vaguely uh, sleepy. Now, I should explain how I came to be interested in the problem which has now become so controversial of the influence of chemicals on the human mind. many, many years, more than 30 years, I've been interested in the psychology of religion, pretty much as a disciple of William James, who was really the first outstanding psychologist of religion, tried to understand what is going on when people have religious experiences. And he concentrated finally and rather particularly on a certain class of religious experience. There are experiences of um, visions. People have revelations. They see Jesus Christ, the Virgin Mary, Krishna, Buddha, or who have you. But these are in a certain way less interesting than the experiences in which the individual has a sudden transformation of his sense of being alive. But these experiences occur sometimes quite spontaneously, true to adolescence or to anyone at almost any time of life. Sometimes they occur as the result of a, uh, or the apparent result, of a uh, discipline, as if you practice yoga, Zen meditation or Catholic um, contemplative prayer, and sometimes they occur as a result of certain ingestion of chemicals. The interesting type of this experience is when the individual is brought to realize that something that we'll have to describe from a number of different points of view. The experience itself is extremely simple. The only thing is that is complicated is when we start to try to describe it in language. The experience itself in its utmost simplicity was once written down by somebody who took uh, nitrous oxide and had a sense of total clarity about all the problems of life. And as he came to our experience, he had his pencil poised over a sheet of paper to write down what was the real nitty gritty about it. And he wrote it down. He really got the point. Then when he returned to normal consciousness, he looked at what he had written. He saw that what he had written 
Of everything in this universe, there's the smell of burnt almonds. <laughs> over which the academic community had a good laugh. He said, well, obviously, this is a perfectly frivolous enterprise. <laughs> but, um, upon mature consideration, everything in this universe is the smell of the That is to say, take any particular experience, such as the smell of the or, uh, looking into the eyes of the person you love, or uh, eating a steak, flying an airplane, lying on the beach in the sun, any experience. There is a way in which that experience implies everything else in the universe. The word implies is probably better than the word is is to say you experience, there are certain statements of consciousness in which you experience that everything is interconnected. Everything goes with everything else. I knew a woman who got in an accident in an elevator. She hadn't taken any drugs. But in this accident she was pinned with her leg caught in the legs. And she was there for half an hour before anybody could get to her rescue having agonies, but she knew that she simply had to wait, there was nothing to do about it, so she completely accepted her situation. She said that in that time she realized, to put it in her, her own words, there is not a single grain of dust in this whole universe that is out of place. In other words, that peculiar, painful, unwanted situation was somehow made acceptable and all right because it fitted in to a harmonious arrangement which involved everything that was happening, that had happened, or that ever would happen. And whether you approve of this kind of experience or not, whether you think it's rational or not, it keeps happening spontaneously through discipline or as a consequence of chemical agencies to thousands of people. And it is, of course, one of the generating forces in the things we call the great religions of the world. Obviously, Jesus Christ uh, had an experience of this kind, which uh, brought him to the feeling that he, as a uh, a living organism was an expression of what he called in the language available to him, God the Father. I and the Father are one. He who has seen me has seen the Father. That was an absolutely unacceptable pronouncement to his contemporaries, so he got crucified. We are, I hope, a more tolerant age, and we are, I think, really in need of experiencing the relationship of the individual to the physical world in a way that is more positive, more constructive, more friendly, more close than that which expresses itself in a hostile technology bent on the domination and the conquest of nation, considered as something alien to the human spirit, mechanical, thoughtless, and stupid, that surrounds us as uh, the mere featureless energy behind the galaxies. If indeed it were possible for many of us to have a sensation of not just uh, merely belonging to this world, but being. If we could feel that our separate individuality is a coming and going expression of 
what it is that is happening through all the cycles of time, generations of cosmos, we'll be able to prove it, not be so tragic in our pursuit of survival. It might be a very good thing. And that's simply giving an explanation of why I personally have been interested in exploring the psychology and the conditions of this kind of experience for so many years. Now then, in the middle 1950s, a British psychiatrist by the name of Humphrey Osmond persuaded a British novelist by the name of Aldous Huxley to take a dose of mescaline. And in the thought that at the time this was a drug which induced states of consciousness similar to schizophrenia, Humphrey Osborne uh, realized that all the Huxley was a marvelous master of words. And therefore, it might be a good idea to see if this experience were given to a man who could describe things in a wonderfully accurate and vivid way, we might learn something about what he does. Aldous Huxley didn't simply deliver a private report to doctors, he rushed into print and published a book called The Dog of Perception, in which he said, in effect, that he felt, from his point of view, that having taken Muslim gave him an experience which he could not but identify with the great mystical experience, man's integration with the universe, which of course had been known uh, through all history. When I read this, as a student of the psychology of religion, I was naturally fascinated. But I'm believing. I thought, you know, all this sometimes goes off the deep end. I knew him very well. And I know he had a kind of enthusiasm for all kinds of novelty. He had foreseen in his novel Brave New World that there might be a way of drugging human beings into sort of perpetual contention and happiness so that they would give no further trouble to each other. Of course, everybody had put this down and said uh, that would be the end of the human spirit. And so I thought maybe this is another of all this weird things, and uh, slightly dismissed it. But then the psychiatrists who had involved in this uh, finally got in touch with me, because they said, you're supposed to be an authority on the psychology of religion, and we'd like to know what you think about.